Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. Our topic today is about the liberal church. You know, liberalism is a term that is much used and little understood. It is used in the political, religious, social, and intellectual arenas, often without definition. In a practical sense, many individuals of a conservative bent would identify a liberal as anyone more open-minded than they are. In fact, religious liberalism involved a commitment to a central set of theological and religious propositions. These propositions, however, when worked out, gave birth, in fact, to a new religion which retained orthodox terminology but radically redefined those terms to give them a new meaning. It is nothing more than modern paganism. Well, with us today to talk about liberalism and the liberal church and how it has affected every area of our lives is Chris Quintana. Chris is the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cypress, California, His sermons can be heard via stream through their website. You may have heard Chris talk about deception on Carol Matriciana's video project, Why Does the Gate? Chris speaks in many conferences nationwide. He has a love for biblical prophecy and sees the modern churches move away from historic Christianity as an indicator of the last days. Welcome, Chris Quintana, to Love for the Truth Radio. It's a pleasure to have you back, as always. (laughs) Well, thanks so much for the invitation. Enjoy uh, enjoy being on the show. You know, Chris, you and I have been talking about this, and it's liberalism. Liberalism in our culture, liberalism in our church, and it touches every area of our lives. Chris, why don't we discuss what liberalism looks like, at least paint a little picture for our audience. Um, uh, for example, it, you know, like, like in the church, one may participate in social justice, uh, doing good by giving to those in need, but not necessarily bringing the gospel with that. Uh, you know, the, the, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, now we're starting to talk about liberalism in terms of the things that we see on the political, secular side of things mm-hmm. um, now making their way into some of the mainstream thought around the church. Okay. And uh, what I find most distressing about it, um, though it shouldn't be unexpected, is the fact that uh, the Scripture says that there should be a very uh, clear distinction between what is the Church and what Mm -hmm. is the world around us. Um, When we think of biblical terms like holiness and sanctification and righteousness and those kind of things, when you even use those terms, you think, well, that's really different than what we see in the world. But now we're seeing the lines blurred so much between where the world ends and the church begins. Mm. And uh, so, you know, now we're we're just seeing things celebrated in the world now being celebrated in the church and that standard's being removed. You know, Chris, um, about that standard being removed, why don't you give us some examples? Um, well, one of the things that we see being a conversation, I guess you could say, is uh, is... The redefinition of marriage is mm-hmm. one of the, the things that's being spoken about in the churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, a number of, of things of, of personal conduct, um, things that we, we used to never consider. Now we hear people excusing various activities under, quote, liberty. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's a very broad term, but the, the, oftentimes isn't it interesting when you hear people talking about exercising their liberty or the liberty that we have in Jesus, it's a way of excusing away something that they are doing. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that, again, more of that removal of the clear distinction between what is the world and what is the church. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like grace has gotten a little bit too far at this point as well. You know, why, why don't we talk about some of the liberalists in high places uh, that we are familiar with? And the reason why I want to go here, Chris, is that uh, people can begin to identify uh, who the people are, you know, uh, maybe what they stand for, what side they're on, and so forth. 
force okay. them to live with sin. Then we mean personalities, right? People that we may know within the church. Yes, absolutely. Yep, okay. either in the political realm, right. in the church, wherever. Just to give a, a view of what liberalists look like. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, when I, they first kind of came onto my radar when everybody started talking in the early days about the emergent church. Mm-hmm. Remember, there was a guy named Rob Bell back then. Oh yeah. So. Uh, and he kind of went away for a while. We didn't hear a lot about him, mm-hmm. and then he comes back out. Yes. And uh, now he's rubbing elbows with Oprah. Yeah. Well, um, there's a good example. Rob Bell is one that at, at one time we didn't know exactly what he was all about. Now we know that he's a universalist. Mm-hmm. So Jim Wallace, another good example. Uh, Jim Wallace was one who uh, was involved around presidential uh, can- campaigns and advising presidents. Uh, Brian McLaren, Tony Campolo, um, maybe names from a little bit further back, uh, guys like Doug Paget and Tony Jones. Mm-hmm. These were guys that were around at the time when Emergent was starting to be used, and they were the ones coining the phrase. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I remember back in the day when Rob Bell was real popular, he had his uh, NUMA films out, and all the, the churches were using his uh, NUMA films in the youth groups. And um, I, I remember back in the day we were telling pastors to be careful because this guy does not believe in, in hell. And there we go. There's one of those beliefs where you just kind of take out of the Bible and, and pretend it's not there. And then Jim Wallace, you just mentioned Jim Wallace. We uh, just just did a show on the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions Convention, and Jim Wallace was there along with Brian McLaren, you know, talking, uh, speaking at uh, at that convention. And what are they talking about? Interfaithism, how we all need to come mm-hmm. together as one. So you're absolutely right. These are some of the liberalists in high places that we were familiar with. And if you're not familiar with them, uh, you might want to look them up, folks. And, and if you are, then and do a deeper study because these are the ones who have brought a lot of liberalism into the church. It's Rob Bell. You have Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace, by the way, goes out to uh, universities and speaks to uh, a lot of our college, a lot of the college campuses. Uh, And by the way, I've heard this. We just did a show on leftism. And, uh, you know, people think right now, well, that's exactly what they're teaching in all universities is leftism or liberalism. Well, lo and behold, Jim Wallace is one of the ones that goes out and speaks. And you'll see Brian McLaren in a lot of those type of conventions, Tony Campolo, and Doug Padgett. I think it was Doug Padgett that said that he believed that uh, Jesus on the cross, the Son of God, was nothing but cosmic uh, child abuse. So here we've got uh, those that are called, quote, Evangelical uh, evangelicals, but uh, their gospel is definitely different than the gospel that we talk about, and that's what we're talking about today. So um, I mentioned some of their agendas, Chris. Uh, what are some of the other agendas, whether it's in the world or, or in our culture uh, of, of liberalism on the on the rise right now? Sure. Uh, well, as you were saying, that that whole bunch of uh, people there. Think mm-hmm. about. How often you'll hear that same group of people will be talking about things like uh, income inequality and and trying to repair the injustices in the third world. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll talk about climate change and how we need to um, you know uh, redistribute wealth. Mm-hmm. Those are the kinds of things that we're also hearing from that very you know really what we would call socialist ideas. Yes, yes, they Interestingly are. Interestingly enough. Right. Now, when did the Church start getting involved in that, and when did they decide to take a decidedly secular and uh, decidedly left uh, political position Mm -hmm. like they take? So, those are not biblical things. Those are what we all hear talked about in the political side of of the equation, and yet now they're being uh, heralded and championed by some within the, the, I would call, the religious left of the Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is what you're talking about in, in the beginning, that, that where's the line? Where do we draw the line there even? You know, now they're bringing mm-hmm. all this into the church, and uh, the church is becoming leftist in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, and I was thinking about the Pope, too, Chris. What, what do you think about that? I mean, po- the Pope is one of the most—they uh, say that he's a liberal uh, Pope, uh, that he's a Jesuit. What are your thoughts on the Pope? Well, there's— um there are plenty of things that he had to say or has had to say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the idea of absolving 
the the whole issue around abortion. That was kind of an interesting one. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's really taken his shots at what he would call capitalism. Um, we've heard a number of things like that, but I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm what I find him to be more more interesting about is how he's dragging um, many people out of the secular world into an embrace of his ideas without mm-hmm. necessarily buying into Catholicism. But he's a very interesting person when it's when you stop to think about how much the world seems to like him. Yes. And he's not such a polarizing figure as most people think Catholics. They think, oh, those staunchly pro, uh, mm-hmm. pro-life pro people, and they categorize them pigeonhole Catholics. Well, he seems to be a darling of the left politically. Yes, he does. Absolutely. Well, when he came to Philadelphia, he was talking about climate change, and that was mm-hmm. one of his main focuses. And on top of it, says that if you don't uh, comply to the laws of climate change, guess what? You're sinning. So now he's pulling that into uh, into a gospel kind of perspective. So, you know, these agendas, uh, you know, how are they different from a Christian's, uh, you know, perspective? Chris, how can we break this down a little bit for, for our audience? Well, now that's where it becomes kind of interesting because mm-hmm. you know it's hard. how do you argue with somebody that says we need to try to do what we can to uh, uh, take care of the poor and the underprivileged? Absolutely. Okay. H- how do you argue against somebody saying that people in the third world have been victimized and we should do something about righting those wrongs? Mm. How do you how do you find that? Yeah. Um, it, the solutions that they offer are a lot of times very very vague. But, mm-hmm. you know, whenever you, you take a stand against that, then you look like just a, a, an insane person. Right. But, but here's one of the things I found very, very interesting, is that in all of his public addresses when the Pope was here, you didn't hear a mention of the gospel, of mm-hmm. sin, of repentance. Jesus was not even uh, the focus of, of any of what he had to say. No. Interestingly enough, it was more of the Church, and that really kind of goes to you know, the theology, I know it's not our topic for today, but, you know, he, he was doing a pretty masterful job of kind of standing in between the two places of being this very secular-sounding person, but he's in the formality of being the head of the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. And like you said, there's a lot of people in high places that accept him. And like you said, he, he, is, uh, he is the darling right now. Actually, he's one of the pawns, I believe, used for, this, uh, for these agendas, uh, the Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. What are your thoughts on that? Of course, because mm-hmm. uh, he's, again, a, a champion of such things. Mm-hmm. So I'm not surprised by any of it. He's saying all the same kind of things there, but now he's able to put a religious face to it, that the world doesn't know the difference between Catholicism and, and just what we would call a Christianity. Mm-hmm. They think the two are, are the same, and now they see him as compatible because of him. Mm-hmm. So, interestingly enough, he's the perfect person in his position for the times in which we live. Yeah, and, and what are your thoughts on, I think it was, was it last year when he was getting together with Robinson and, and uh, Copeland and, uh, you know, a few of the evangelicals that people are recognized? And I think he even was getting together with, if I'm not mispa- mistaken, if I am, please tell me, but uh, with, um, oh, geez, and some of the other, Osteen, yeah, Joel Osteen, I couldn't think of his name off that much. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, well, it, and then yeah. Rick, Rick Warren kicked off the yeah. whole thing in, in uh, your neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so what do you think the agenda is? What's going on there with with the, all of these guys coming together? I mean, you know, would you? I, I wouldn't necessarily call them a liberalist, but but then again, it seems like they're falling prey to that same kind of mindset because they don't always preach the gospel truth. You know, we're going on a break. Uh, We'll be right back with Chris Quintana, pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cypress, California. We're going to continue on talking about the grave influence of liberal thought. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views from a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, 
and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. So please, take everything you hear on this radio program to study and prayer, and thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for Love for the Truth Radio. And with me today is Chris Quintana, pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cyprus, California, to continue our conversation on liberalism, which we will discover in the end is actually modern paganism. Uh, we're going to be talking about the grave influence of liberal thought in our societies, culture, and the church, and how it affects us today. You know, in the beginning, liberalism was actually a system used by Christians in an effort to hold to their convictions in the face of a rising onslaught of unbelief and new enlightenment, which they perceived they were powerless to withstand against. So rationalism sprang from their efforts, and a new movement arose from within the church as they surrendered to an unbiblical accretions and features because scripture was no longer considered defensible in the modern world. In seeking to fight against enlightenment, they became more liberal and tolerant through reasoning rather than using the Lord's word and fell even more prey to the system of enlightenment, the new liberalism. Chris, um, what are I know we talked about it, but what are some of the elements of liberalism? Well, you just, you hit it, it when well, we're trying to take a look at what's happening with the church. You just <laughs> explained exactly the, the essence of the problem. Mm -hmm. the, the world and its pressure and what it expects of people and conduct and all the rest of it, when the church will not stand upon the very clear teaching of the Word of God, mm -hmm. then they really don't have a leg to stand on. Mm -hmm. So whatever culturally is relevant, whatever is culturally acceptable, then they're going to go ahead and, and buy into that if they don't have the Word of God to stand upon. Because just think about it. Yeah. What is going on in the Church now wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. Right, exactly. But slowly but surely, incrementally, uh, we find corruption that's made its way into the Church mm -hmm. in the, in the, the uh, under the guise of, of thought and and uh, of uh, acceptance and relevance and all those little coin words that mm -hmm. we're hearing all the time. Right. I I'm, I'm amazed at some of the lowering of the standards even within what we would consider as some of the the more traditional conservative denominations are beginning to look more like the world than they were the church. That's right. That's right. And you know, um you you said relevance. I remember what was it in the 90s? early 2000s, when relevance was such a big word, uh, we were working with the youth groups at that time, that that's all they used, that okay. this the person was coming out that is relevant, you know, to the teens, and, you know, be a little more relevant to them so they understand we heard that word a lot, and now I think we're, we're getting into tolerance, you know. Um, it seems like, I know that one of the elements I was reading uh, about liberalism was that any truth must justify itself before the bar of reason. Uh, also, that nature is the primary source of answers to the fundamental questions of human existence. That's why we have the climate change thing going on. Uh, freedom is necessary to advance and progress human welfare. That's why we've got the uh, the whole thing economically, you know, that, uh, what did you say, to distribute wealth. Um, mm -hmm. But this all falls under liberalism, the need for critical right. philosophy. And then, you know, we talk about postmodernism. Uh, that is, you know, uh, that's your thought. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Uh, let's put our doctrines aside and all get along. You know, and that, yeah. that seems like, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Well, again, here's one of those things. That it, the way that they frame that is how can you find fault with that? I mean, if, you, if you're going to argue against that, you're going to seem like a crazy person. So it's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that I've got, I've got to give them credit for. They're really good about redefining terms. Yes. And they're taking just common English terms that we understand, mm -hmm. and they're kind of turning them on their heads. Yes. And so w when I hear relevant, let's, let's just take a look at what the Bible would say about relevance. Okay. Paul is a great example, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if Paul is talking to an audience, tonight we're in the book of Hebrews at church. Um, good chance is that Paul is the one who wrote that. Mm -hmm. And if he is, he's obviously writing to an audience that has a deep, full understanding of, of Jewish things, and so he's mm -hmm. talking to them as a Jewish person. Mm 
Right. But then when it comes to, say, his address at Mars Hill in Chapter 17, he's talking to them as pagans in ways that pagans would understand, but in either place he never compromised his Christian belief. Right. So Mm. there's a brilliance in, in the way that Paul does those things, and it's why he was able to say, I can become all things to all men. That's right. That I might win some. But he never had to in any way compromise anything about what it was that he believed and how he expressed mm-hmm. those beliefs. He just yeah. understood his audience and didn't have to be like his audience. Right. And you know, that I think you just you, you hit it right there, compromise Christian beliefs, and that's what we've done. We've taken relevance and made it more relevant, meaning more relevant for well, let's let's explain that to our audience. Uh, let's look at what did relevance mean back in the day when they were using relevance in the church. Mm-hmm. Well, here's why we started to say you know, mm-hmm. we hear these people talking about relevance and they began to look like the world. They mm-hmm. began to talk like the world. Right, that's they right. They began to kind of diminish some of the standards mm-hmm. of, of just conduct. And sometimes the, it, Mark Driscoll was a great example of this. Mm-hmm. He would use crass language. I remember he that. Would be, yeah, you remember, yeah, he was a, one of the first guys that really took this to a, a, a real and different love, level. Yeah, he did. And so his justification was, well, we're talking with street people in, in Seattle, and so mm-hmm. we're talking to them in terms that they'll understand. But some of the right. stuff that he said was just very base, and it was very crass. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and sometimes he was being quite profane, and you know, some of the stuff wasn't even PG-rated anymore. No, and you're thinking, no. okay, well, mm-hmm. for the pursuit of relevance, you have now gotten to the point where you're almost indistinguishable sometimes from the rest of the world. That's right. I mean, he was uh, literally cursing from the pulpit. And I remember a lot of the youth were coming to me saying this was the cool thing now, that this guy really has it because he understands them. But see, the problem is we need to understand Christ. And the only way we're going to do that is when someone is uh, teaching from the pulpit is teaching the word, the living word. Uh, you know, how do, you know this, this same mindset. Chris, it plays out in our culture in general, in the political realm, in the educational realm, in our culture. Uh, you were mentioning earlier about uh, how it's it, it, anti-Semitism and, and some of uh, the other topics that you were talking about. The, yeah, there's another great example. Yeah. So, um, w- what we had mentioned a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. again, did you ever envision in your earliest of years that the day would come when churches would be having a very serious discussion about the redefinition of marriage. No, never. Can marriage now be accepted as between one man and one uh, one other man, or is it mm. only going to be as traditionally one man, one woman? Yes. Um, it, it, we never would have. You couldn't have ever convinced me that we'd be talking about this in the Church. Never. But we're mm-hmm. seeing entire denominations doing mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and putting them and, up at the pulpit, too, to lead others. Sure. Yep. There you go. Now, we know that from the Reformation, I mean, Luther, and, and uh, uh, Luther in particular, was grossly anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. And so many of the early Reformers had a view of Israel that because they rejected Jesus, then they had lost all of the promise, and those had been incorporated into the Church. And, I, you know, I don't give them a pass on that, Mm-mm. but I can in some small way understand it, because where was Israel in the 1500s and the 1600s and all that? It was nowhere to be found. That's right. Yeah. But in in this last century, not only is Israel back in the land, but they are supernaturally thriving. Mm-hmm. And they are, needless to say, a supernatural uh, manifestation of God regathering His people like the Scripture told us. Yes. But how many churches are buying into the anti-Israeli, pro-Palestinian narrative? Mm. Um, and I think of guys like Donald Miller. Great example. Mm-hmm. Donald Miller um, offered up the prayer at the Democratic National Convention in 2008 when they uh, nominated Barack Obama. Hmm. And he's the guy that talks about Gaza as being the world's largest outdoor uh, prison. And that's just, that's not uh, hmm. verifiable on the facts alone, but it, it just speaks of an ignorance of, of a knowledge of how God views Israel. Yeah. Yeah, and so that this is where we're seeing the liberal thought come in, 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 our, in our societies, our culture, in our church. Uh, it affects every area of our lives. Uh, you know, and, you know, 
I was reading up on this, uh, Chris, and when we look at liberalism, it really looks like the pagan spirit, the liberal, modern pagan spirit. But I think what's really uh, troubling is that how in the church— uh, that we've been vexed with that same spirit, and and oftentimes we can we worship God, we're worshiping God, uh, but but with a different gospel. Well, that certainly has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing a resurgence of uh, of kind of a lot of uh, middle age mysticism that's making its way into the meditative and yeah. the prayer practices. Um, we're finding that man is becoming. Uh, so much more the center and the focus of worship, and, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's an odd time in the church that from so many different directions we see uh, a changing in in the dynamics of the church itself. So mm-hmm. yeah, the when, when we see the kind of practices taking place in a spiritual sense, that you could say, man, that's no different than Eastern thought and New Age thought. Uh, man becomes the sovereign, speaking things into existence and all of that. Again, what is the Church doing embracing any of that stuff? Yeah, yeah. well, I think you, you hit it right on the head there, is that we become man-centered focus instead of God focus. You know, we see, the, you know, your best life now, look in the mirror, tell yourself how wonderful you are, keep saying it over and over again, positive thinking, you know, and all of that. And certainly that is not the gospel that we read uh, in our Bibles. You know, we are to take right. up our cross and follow and die to ourselves. you know, and, and to grow spiritually uh, by what we're told in the Bible and have good, be good, uh, be people of good character. So I was trying to right. say. So we can see here that this liberal thought is actually twisting uh, the, the what the Bible is actually saying, and it's becoming more tolerant. We've compromised our Christian beliefs. Um, we're now moving towards a different kind of spirit. It's not the spirit of Jesus Christ. We're vexed with a liberal kind of modern pagan spirit through this liberalism. So uh, do you have any other thoughts, Chris? in this area. Sure, and uh, I would say that from the, the opening premise of what you just said, mm-hmm. is this not at the base of it? Man is no longer, as his primary source of truth, looking to the Scripture, mm-hmm. but he's looking to what, well, what did this guy write in his book, or what is this church doing, or, or everything else. We're looking at everybody else's model, yeah. rather than beginning with the Scripture. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you just, you said it, too. You said model, looking at everyone's model. I think that was the problem. Uh, we look back at Bill Hybels and how they had a particular model of a seeker-sensitive or seeker-friendly church. And there was a model that everybody was trying to follow to get more people into their church instead Mm -hmm. of uh, people being the church and coming in because they've been born again and their nature is changing and they have a desire to follow Christ. Now we followed a model. Well, we're going on a break. With us is Chris Quintana, pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cypress, California. We'll be right back to continue our conversation on liberalism in the church. So please stay tuned. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times. Grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Hi, I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for today, and with us is Chris Quintana, pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cypress, California. Chris's sermons can be heard via stream through their website. You may have heard of Chris talk about deception, even on Carol Matriciana's video project, Why Does the Gate? Chris speaks in many conferences and on numerous Christian film projects. 
projects nationwide. And uh, we're talking about liberalism in the church and how it's just infiltrated the mindset of the people, getting us off the mark of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, liberalism is basically moving away from traditional historic interpretation of Scripture into new interpretations that are more consistent with secular views. And sadly, there are so-called Christian liberals that use the name of Jesus Christ, but not his gospel truth. And Chris, I want to talk about these Christian lib liberals, but leaders that have been very influential to our church, especially in the last 20 years. Uh, we talked about, just before the break, we talked about Bill Hybels of Willow Creek. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, in my office I have a book. Uh, it was written in the early 90s, and the title of the book is uh, America's Ten Most Influential Churches, or something very close to that. Um, but those, that's the, the title, those words are in the title of the book. And one of them was, at the time that I got the book, I wouldn't have known who Bill Hybels was. Mm. Um, but now, uh, Bill Hybels and Willow Creek and the Willow Creek Association of Churches is in the tens of thousands. And right. so the influence that he's had on the church is enormous. Yes. They do their leadership summit every year, and they've mm -hmm. had people like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and Bono mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other you know, real high-profile people come yes. out and talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. But it's not leadership from a personal or from a—I'm uh, sorry, from a Christian point of view. So this just shows the kind of influence that the church has now, and now the church is being influenced by secular people and being celebrated by them. Mm -hmm. But what, what we find out about 30 years ago, when Willow Creek started there out, outside of Chicago, they wanted to reach out to this little euphemistic group called the Unchurched, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And so they went into the area around Willow Creek and started surveying the people in that uh, surrounding area and asked if they attended church. Right. And if they said that they didn't, they wanted to find out why. Mm -hmm. So what they found out was that people were threatened by what was the normal church. They didn't want to be talked to about tithing. They didn't want to be talked down to like a professor. They didn't want a whole bunch of these different things. And so then Willow Creek said, well, great, we're going to build a church that doesn't do any of those things. Right. Well, sometimes the things that people hate the most is when the Scripture is, is taught accurately, and it's going to confront them on a number of issues. That's right. And so... That was one of their complaints. And mm -hmm. so there, you'll notice that at uh, Willow Creek and their affiliated kind of churches, there is going to be a very watered-down version of the, quote, gospel, mm -hmm. and it becomes much more about action. It becomes more about, as Rick Warren likes to say, it becomes more about deeds than creeds. Right. Well, that sounds great and all the rest of it, but then that means that salvation is of not work. And these guys are of an eschatology that they believe that they're going to usher in the kingdom of God by living the gospel and doing these things around the world. Hmm. So, you yeah. know, interestingly, I want to examine the fruit of their ministry and say, if you guys are building the kingdom of God, then I want to take a look around at the world and see how your efforts are going. Yeah. Well, the world's melting down, folks. Yes, it is. These guys aren't doing so hot. No, no, they're not. And, you know, like you said, they built their church on what the people wanted. To, and what did the mm -hmm. Lord say? That, you know, men want to be right in their own eyes. I feel like we've gone back to Babel trying to build their own kingdoms, and that's exactly what they're doing. And, you know, Hybels was a protege of Robert Schuller, which uh, we know that uh, he listened to or, or, or was a disciple of Norman Vincent Peale's type of, I have to say, philosophy, because it was not mm -hmm. the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. So let's look at that, uh, Chris. Uh, Hybels kind of fell prey into that positive kind of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. And let's face it, Cindy, if we, you and I look at, the, look at it like this, you and I, would, if somebody was to come to us and say, Jesus loves you and died for your sins, mm -hmm. we're going to get a big smile on our face and say, you know, his death is grievous to me, but I understand the depths of his love because he did die on the cross. And that's what all. That's all that I need to know is the, the depths of God's love for me that He died in my place. Mm -hmm. Other people would look at that and say, "Well, that's such a negative story because somebody had to die because of your guilt." Let's not talk about your guilt. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the positive things. Right. Well, that was typical Schulerism, and mm -hmm. two of his biggest, you know, a advocates now, whether they would directly want to talk about him or not, is mm -hmm. Rick Warren and Bill Hybels. And yeah. So, of the pastors that we see, and guys like Joel Osteen, same kind of a thing, he's got that 
different kind of a word faith mentality yes. to them, but still they're all the same thing. Mm-hmm. Everything is positive. Everything is cool. Everything is great. Mm-hmm. Everything in this world, you know, it's your oyster, go and get it kind of a thing. And if we're going to take a look at the scripture, the scripture tells us something entirely different right. before the Lord returns. And part of that problem that, that is predicted, especially through Paul's writings, is the corruption within the church and the removal of biblical absolutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's been prophesied. Well, look at that word prophecy, not to say, but here we have Rick Warren saying, oh, don't don't look at prophecy. Uh, you know, have you heard a lot of that? I know that, uh, Chris, you talk a lot about prophecy, but there are a lot of preachers out there, ministers that say we don't need to bother ourselves in looking at that, particularly Rick Warren. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, when I hear a pastor say that, then I realize he's not really a pastor. Hmm. Um he, well. he may have the title, but that's more what a hireling would say. Mm-hmm. We just finished the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings. All that one needs to do is take a look at the first and the last chapter, and this is a, a, a prophecy that was told to us by John about the revealing of Jesus, and about end-time things. In the first few verses, we're told that there is a blessing to the person who hears and keeps the words of this prophecy, Mm -hmm. speaking of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a similar thing that's said in the 22nd chapter, Mm -hmm. that we are to be prepared for the time is at hand. So if we're we're told that Jesus says, behold, I come quickly, and the time is at hand, and those kinds of things, then that should make you realize, well, then what time is at hand, and how would I know that it's at hand? Yeah. Well by a study of the Scripture. So, pertaining to the end times, my goodness, if somebody ever did take the time to do it, and they removed every end times passage out of the Scripture, I think we would find that the volume of the of the Old mm-hmm. and New Testament is much, much smaller when you remove end times things. Yes. Yeah, I heard that, th- what is it, Three? how much, three-fourths of the Bible or, uh, is prophecy, or one-fourth? I forget what the, the ratio is. Uh, it's enormous. It's enormous. Let's just look at it that way. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because, again, you look at someone like Hybels, who was probably one of the most influential pastors, leading and guiding other pastors through his summer summit leadership uh, conference, which I used to attend years and years ago until I saw that he had a lot of speakers that were not even Christians. They were great leaders, but they were not Christians. So why would I sit at the feet of someone else and try to learn how to be a great Christian uh, when they're not they're not even saved? Very, very interesting, and yet very influential. I think back in the day, uh, probably in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, I think there was like, my, the last time I saw, there was like 89,000 pastors who attended. And if you look on the Hybels uh, website, you'll see all the sermons that they actually use, you know, in their churches. So that's how influential that was. That's how liberalism began to come in. It came in with tolerance. It came in with seeker-friendly. It came in to, uh, by following man's ways instead of God's ways. And, and then we look at uh, Rick Warren, another huge influential uh, pastor that is, uh, he's really big on uh, social justice. I mean, if you remember not too long ago, it was the big buzzword in all the churches. We need to be missional, and we're, we're, we're into social justice. Now, what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Uh-huh. Well, again, to me, it's another distraction that's, that's in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I see many churches, and big ones at that. I mean, it, it, let's be honest, if... Mm-hmm. if um, if they were doing something wrong, so the theory goes, then God wouldn't be blessing them with their thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Well, I know that uh, people can be blessed by the enemy as well, because mm-hmm. if they're not preaching the gospel, and if they're not being true to the Word of God, what more would the devil want them to do? Um, yeah. You're going to have a dumbed-down group of people that are in the church that don't really understand the essentials of salvation. And mm-hmm. so... The idea that they would have a lot of earthly success, that, that comes as no surprise to me. And I don't, I don't need to know how big a person's church is. All I need to know is what it is that they're teaching. That's, That's all right. that matters. Yeah. So the numbers mean nothing. 
That's right. Well, you're going to get more numbers on the wide road anyway than you are on the narrow. But uh, Exactly. You know, I mean, like, you just look at that. I remember a pastor said uh, one time, and I don't mean to, I won't mention names or anything here, but I remember him saying, look at all the fruit we have. Look in the parking lot and see all the cars. He was saying that the fruit was the amount of cars rather than the fruit being the fruit of the Spirit, like in Galatians 5. So, you know, so there are, there are some denials of doctrinal truth, uh, that seems to be what they do, is to, to deny doctrinal truth. Um, I remember there was a time, Chris, that people were saying that uh, we shouldn't read Genesis because it's nothing but a metaphor, right? Yeah, uh, prophecy yeah. is not for us today. What are your thoughts on that? I, you know, I was just having that discussion with a bunch of pastors yesterday, mm-hmm. and Here's the, the the insidious thing. I am so glad you said that. Hmm. The insidious thing about about saying, well, the the book of Genesis isn't literal. It's it's meant to be allegorical. And, mm-hmm. and of course, I chuckle at that and I say, well, okay. Then if it's an allegory and it's trying to tell us some spiritual truth, then explain to me why God wrote the book of Genesis in the creation account. What is that supposed to be out yeah, to? Right. What, what, what's that supposed to be? So Good. the danger with that, if you just say it's a fanciful story, well, when did God get into the, the, the uh, place of telling stories? Right. And <laughs> if he's going to tell a story, which Jesus told parables, he would either explain them, mm-hmm. or it was very clear what was being said. So if God says, I created the earth and everything that you see, and here's how I did it, but if that's somehow symbolic or allegorical or whatever else, then please tell me what he's trying to tell us. That's right. So <laughs> it's the, the scary thing about it is that I want to ask the person that says that, well, who gave you license to, to do that to the Scripture? And if you'll do that, and if it's not to be taken literal, then please tell me where is the line with what is and what is not literal. Exactly. Please show me where that is, or else everybody's going to do it subjectively. That's right. Right, well, there we go, the, li- the liberal, the the liberal thought, the liberal thought all over again. And, you know, if you you think, think <laughs> about it, yeah, Genesis, if, if Genesis is, is a metaphor or, or, or an allegory or and prophecy is not for us today, just think about that, Chris, then nothing in the center between Genesis and, and Revelation mean a thing because we don't know where right. we came from at that point and we definitely don't know where we're going. So, right. I mean, that's just uh, the the. And Enemy's plot uh, and messing with the word as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we have about okay. uh, five seconds, Chris. Um, anyway, let's go back really quick to Genesis 3, because I meant you, you had mentioned it about did God really say. You know, we're going on a break, so why don't we say that when we come back? But uh, anyway, we're here with Chris Quintana. We're going on a break. We're talking about liberalism in the church, where it came from, who are the big uh, influential leaders of it. We'll be back to talk about the modern paganism and its practices. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. Our guest today is Chris Quintana, pastor, a conference speaker. He has a love for Bible prophecy and sees the modern churches move away from historic Christianity as an indicator of the last days. Liberalism will take everyone away from biblical truth, and that's exactly what we've been talking about. But guess what? There is nothing new under the sun. Satan is up to his old tricks. He's the same yesterday. I mean, he's the same today as he was yesterday. Chris, you and I were talking about uh, in Genesis 3, did God really say there's nothing new? He's doing the same thing, and it's amazing that we're falling prey to the same deception. 
Yeah, isn't that frustrating? Uh, <laughs> chapter 3 of Genesis, it's amazing. <laughs> chapter 3, verse 1, the very first word, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts mm-hmm. of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said? Mm-hmm. And so it was casting doubt on, You're not supposed to eat of the tree. Mm-hmm. So at the very beginning, the premise of it is that uh, well, the devil knows the Bible better than any of the rest of us. Mm-hmm. So for him to find a way to try to make and put and place doubt in the church, it's best to do it through the people that are uh, that are supposed to be the, the overseers, the pastors, the mm-hmm. leadership, and get them into a place of corruption. And so nothing new, always casting doubt on the Word of God. Yeah. And and that same thing is did God really say? I mean we we everything we've been talking about, everything is just slightly twisted. You know, when the mm-hmm. word is slightly twisted, it becomes a new meaning. And like we were saying with liberalism before, is that they use the same terminology, but it has a different definition, a different meaning to what uh what the, the I say the church, but the church has been deceived too, but what it's supposed right. to mean through biblical truth. Uh mm-hmm. so what else do you have? Uh, to talk about as far as Genesis? I know you had some things in your heart. Yeah, here's a couple of real quick examples. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, because of the the science, quote-unquote, that proves that the the, uh, universe is ancient and that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, that's what, I mean, everybody seems to agree on that on the the secular side of things. Mm -hmm. So now you have, in the Church, there's a, 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 a group of people that hold to what they call theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. So this is the way of trying to marry the world with the Church. And so people would say, well, I believe that God created, but I believe He created the evolutionary process. Well, there's a problem with that. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, even death then through that sin, and Mm -hmm. thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. This tells us in in other places as well that there was a death before the fall and because of sin. Now, the Mm -hmm. people will tell us that the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, but they don't believe that man is that old. They're not 65 million years old. Right. Well, then that tells me that these people believe that there was death before sin. Because if the the dinosaurs died way back then, before man was even born, then the Bible's inaccurate. Mm Mm-hmm. And so you undermine the entirety of the Scripture. Um, When you get into those types of questioning of these people who have an alternate view of the Scripture, yet profess themselves as believers, you want to say, Mm -hmm. you need to come to grips with the fact that what you're saying doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Here's what's more important. God said that He created everything, and animals in particular, after their own kind. That's right. So when God made a dog, it's always been a dog. It didn't evolve from something else. Mm -hmm. So do I believe the theistic evolutionist, or do I believe the Genesis account? That's right. So there are so many examples like Mm -hmm. that of just looking at the Scripture and say, modern liberal Christian thought runs totally contrary to the, the clearly stated Word of God. Right, exactly, and one of the elements of liberalism says uh, that raising the value of science as the avenue by which man can find truth, and uh, and going back to the beginning of scientific history, uh, that's where po- postmodern thought came from, you know, and, unless you can prove it through science, you know, then it's not the truth. Mm-hmm. So we have... Uh, you know, this toleration that has crept in. You know, uh, folks, we've been talking about the grave influence of liberalism and its effects on our societies, culture, and church. Uh, the liberals elevated human reason to near divine status as ascribed to uh, to it the ability to discern truth of all types with, uh, without appeal to supernatural divine revelation. Whether it's liberal thought, man's reasoning, or new enlightenment, it all falls into a melting pot of modern paganism, and I think that's what we're, would you agree with that, Chris, that we, that this is a form, uh, you know, when we take all of this, we're talking about uh, tolerance, relevance, uh, we're talking about the liberal thought, the postmodern thought, you know, it's in the end, all these different types of uh, religions seem to fall into this melting pot. How are they going to get on the same mindset for the new world religion? I believe it's the modern paganism. Yeah, because what you what you have 
and we're seeing it take place all around us. Mm-hmm. We see the, the bumper stickers all over the place, you know, the coexist stuff. Yeah, there it is, and exactly. God, man, and how, again, here's one of those things. How do you find fault with that? How do you find fault with the mm-hmm. idea that can't mm-hmm. we just all get along? That's right. I mean, you're going to look like a complete lunatic if you say, well, I don't want to get along with that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to coexist with, with people who believe as they believe. That's right. That makes you seem kind of nutty. But if we look at it and say, no, 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 wait, what they believe mm-hmm. is contrary to the scripture. I mean them no harm. In fact, I want to evangelize them. Mm-hmm. But to try to say that I can reconcile the God of the Bible who is deeply personal and demonstrated how deeply personal he was that he became flesh and dwelt among us and died on a cross because man had a problem with sin. Mm-hmm. No other religion believes that nor teaches it. Mm-hmm. So how do I find common ground with people that tell me a totally contrary view of how did we get here and what is our responsibility before our Creator God? I can't coexist with that, no. at, at least in the way of trying to say that there's no difference between us. I can live next door to those people. I right. can have a, a very normal relationship with them. But mm-hmm. to think that we have common ground is just nonsense. Mm-mm. No. Well, you can't have the gospel with uncommon ground with human reasoning. I mean, especially if Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation that comes out from that cornerstone, everything is to be built upon. If that cornerstone mm-hmm. is human reasoning, uh, then we have a problem. The foundation is going to have cracks, and it's not going to be the same uh, foundation, and we can't build anything on it. So the cornerstone has to be Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. Uh, you know, it doesn't stop at human reason, though. Chris, and this is why I want to talk about this. It goes further into the divine revelation and spiritual practices, uh, which are not of God. And that's what we're seeing a lot of today. I mean, I remember walking down through a Barnes and Noble, and on the shelves of the where the teens' books were, there was all this uh, this supernatural kind of uh, books that you know channeling and spirit guides and all that kind of stuff we see in our regular culture. But now we're seeing it in the church. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, but I, I think of Bill Johnson's School of the Prophets. He has little children going to uh, to heaven and back and giving mm-hmm. a, an account of what they saw there, and yet I believe that's channeling spirit guides. You know, that's, that type Agreed. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I was thinking about that, uh, how we, in the name of Jesus, and, and yet these people still call themselves evangelicals or Christians, uh, or followers of Christ, and I think that's very disturbing uh, at this point because, like you said, it's really hard to define now what is truth, and the lines are getting very gray, very fuzzy. It's hard to tell, you know, I like you said, from the beginning, we should be able to, to know what is of the world, what is of the evil spirits, and what is of Christ, and now everything seems to be mixing together. Let's talk about the, the golden calf that the Israel built Israelites built in the wilderness uh, to their newfound God. How is it likened to Christians today, using God's name but worship, worshiping Him in other uh, in their own ways? Well, you mentioned what I think is a very, very disturbing trend, and that's uh, the new apostolics that we yes. see. These are people who believe that they have a mandate that is greater than that which was given to the apostles in the beginning, wow. you know, at the beginning of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they'll look at, at these supernatural manifestations, and they'll say, see, there's the evidence that what we're doing is genuine, because right. look at the manifestations. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, again, hard to argue with that unless you take a biblical view of it. Mm-hmm. So whatever the experience is, then I want to be able to say, then can we prove that scripturally and test the experience to be sure that it's actually genuine? Mm-hmm. When, it, when a person comes to me and tells me that he's a modern apostle or a, a modern prophet, I would want to say, well, what was left undone by the original guys? Yeah. So, <laughs> what, what further revelation was necessary? I, I'm, not, I'm not following here. Mm-hmm. But it, what's interesting between them and the ones that we had mentioned a little bit earlier the, uh, the people that are into, say, what we call contemplative prayer or the meditative practices of mm-hmm. mantra and, and repeating the same words over and over and over again. I don't put, I, you know, I'm certainly not going to put a guy like Bill Johnson in the same category as a lady like, say, Phyllis Tickle. Right. She comes from an Episcopalian background, and, and uh, Bill Johnson is into these wild manifestations in the uber-charismatic realm of things. Mm-hmm. They don't sound anything alike. Right. Other than the fact that they say the experience validates what we're saying. That's right, yeah. And so, 
That's the problem. Everything is experiential and never taken mm-hmm. against the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And again, to a guy like Bill Johnson, how do you argue when he says we have a different mandate that's superior to the last apostles? Right, especially when he says we have the manifestations of today. And, you know, that's the big buzzword today is experience. Well, I experienced, I can't tell you how many people, and even beloved people, you know, saying that, that they experience gold dust, you know, and, and God the Father mm-hmm. loves me so much that he put gold dust on me. And that's his way of, of telling me that he loves me. And I know he's real and I know he's there because I can touch and feel, you know. And it seems like we're, instead of being spiritual according to the Bible, walking by the Spirit, being led of the Spirit, Spirit, what's happening is we're being fleshly in the experience and calling that uh, the experience. And, you know, that kind of gets into the demonic. Would you agree with that? It has to be, because, mm-hmm. again, if we know that these would not be godly manifestations because he's not going to be confusing people. And mm-hmm. anybody who's watched those church services, if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. it, it is corn. I mean, this is abuse of the Spirit in the in the kind of way that, that Paul talked about when he was dealing with Corinth. Yeah. And so we're watching it. Yeah, exactly. They they were using their, their gifts in a very uh, demonic type of way, and we're seeing that happen today. I think that's why they kind of took the gifts out of the church, which I believe is uh, Satan's way of taking away our tools. I mean, that's just a thought. We can use that for maybe another show. But, um, yeah, I know it's a whole nother, a whole nother thing. But, you know, exactly. folks, we have, yeah, we have, we have people channeling their way to heaven and gold dust. No wonder some of the people watching this stuff don't really find Christ. Uh, they feel like it's very, uh, very odd, very strange, very weird. But it seems like the enemy has covered all the different territories. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we just talked about liberal thought today, but there's so many other uh, different doctrines, different philosophies that people are following, they're getting confused. You know, tell us about Matthew 24 when he talks about deception, Chris. Huh. Well, great, great question. Mm-hmm. Chapter, chapter 24 is, you know, kind of the quintessential from Jesus' perspective of telling us about what the things are going to be like in the end times. And everybody will look at that and say, oh, that's that wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, pestilence, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's true. That's yeah. one of the things he said. These are the beginning of sorrows. But he begins that address by talking about, do not be deceived because many will come in my name. That's what you want to focus on. Deception is the first. So for him to be able to say deception is going to be one of the first examples when you know that you're in that end of the age, beware. We ought to be paying attention to deception before anything else. Mm-hmm. We're going on a break. We'll be right back. So please stay tuned. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. I want to personally thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Please visit our website at www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. That's www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. Well, we've had a wonderful discussion with Chris Quintana, Uh, Pastor of Calvary Chapel, Cypress, California. Chris, you know, we've talked a lot about what's going on, and people's heads are probably spinning, thinking, okay, great, what do I do now? What advice can you give them? Well, you know, I'll go back to one of the things that you had opened up with, and you explained it a couple of times, of of who and what I am. I am the pastor at Calvary Chapel of Cypress. Uh, I wouldn't even know about the topics that you and I talk about when I come on the show if it wasn't for the fact that my first primary reason for being here is to pastor. Mm. And uh, by pastoring, I'm supposed to be one who teaches through the Scriptures, teaching the Word of God. Mm. That's that's what I do. And as a result of that, these things became obvious to me that we're in a time where the cautions that were given to us are playing out as we see them. Mm. So uh, what that means, the, the answer to your question, is that we need to be proficient and very, very well versed in God's word, and we won't be deceived. That's right. Yeah, and and yeah, and and, and uh, you must be a wonderful pastor. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to hear from you. If you don't have a church out there, you can get onto uh, Chris's website. I know he has a lot of streaming, right, Chris? They can watch your sermons. We live stream everything. So mm-hmm. at our church's website, if people just look for Calvary Chapel of Cypress in California, um, they can just pull it up there right on our front page. It says live stream. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. or watch live. And uh, yeah, we, we go through the Old Testament on Sunday nights, through the New Testament on Wednesday nights, and we do a study in one of the books of the Bible on the Sunday mornings, and we live stream every service. Mm-hmm. And also, you can hear Chris Quintana on um, some of our f- former radio programs. If you get on to uh, lovefortheTruthRadio.com, lovefortheTruthRadio.com on our website, look up Chris Quintana, and you'll see some of the other uh, shows that we've done together, particularly of deception in the church. I know there's been a lot of people watching that, keeping their eye on that. But anyway, thanks, Chris. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Uh, we're looking forward to having you back as a contributor. Uh, God bless you, Chris. Thanks again for your wealth of information and god bless you audience we'll see you next week so please take care 